It's awfully cold. It's really cold. And those people, they don't see me. They just walk by. It's really cold. I wonder if someone will get me a cup of coffee. Well, see you in worship. And then just before we sing this song, um, when they said they were going to be talking about the rich man and Lazarus, um, this song came to my head, and it's not necessarily a worship song per se, but it, it really talks about, you know, we are like the rich man in the way that, not that we are rich necessarily, um, but we are rich because we have Jesus, and that's so much that we have to offer, and that's so much that we can be offering other people. Um, and there's so many times, and I mean, there's so many times that we just... We don't. We don't. We aren't the hands that are reaching. We aren't the hands that are healing. We aren't the words that are teaching. Um, but we have to be. Um, we have to be out there, and we have to be sharing what we have with other people. Um, so just as we sing this song, um, it's just kind of a reflection song. You know, we have to be the ones out there going forward. Um, yeah. Crowded in worship today As she slips in Trying to fade into the faces The girls teasing laughter is carrying Farther than they know Farther than they know But if we are the body Why aren't his eyes? Welcome to worship here at St. Andrews, and we welcome those who are watching us online. A call to worship is printed. I invite you to respond with a bold print. It will also appear on the screen. The Lord be with you. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Know that the Lord is God, is he who made us, and we are his. 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Let us pray. God of grace, we come to you this morning to hear you speak, to hear your challenge and your comfort, your words of hope. Because we need those things in our lives, particularly we need them now in this moment as individuals and as a nation. Speak to us, we pray. Your hope, your words of encouragement, the promise that you are with us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer of confession is printed. Let's pray this together in unison. God of everlasting love, we confess that we have been unfaithful to our covenant with you and with one another. We have worshipped other gods, money, power, greed, and comfort. We have served our own self-interest instead of serving only you and your people. We have not loved our neighbor as you commanded. We have not rightly loved ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God, and bring us back into the fullness of our covenant with you and one another. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Thanks be to God that we have been forgiven, that we might begin again as the followers of Jesus Christ, made new in his love and grace alone. Amen. you do great. 
We as a nation have had a difficult week. There's no two ways about that. And I admit that I am at a loss for profound words. I don't have them anymore. I do think that the passage from Micah chapter 6, what is required of human beings, but to love mercy and seek justice, and to walk humbly with our God, speaks to us in this moment. And to say more will make it look as though I'm blaming people, taking a side. I'm not. But let me just quickly say why I think those are important. I don't see a lot of mercy in our country right now. On any side, I don't see any very much mercy. I see definitions of justice that are about my definition of justice being predominant, whatever my is. And I don't see a lot of humility. I think we need those things that we as people who follow Jesus Christ should be people who love mercy, seek justice, God's justice, and walk humbly with God. Let's pray. Lord God, we are at a difficult moment as a nation. We have been for a long time, but it has just escalated this week. Change us as your people who follow you. Shape in us that we would be people who love mercy. That we would be people who model our lives seeking your justice. And that above all, we would walk humbly with you. For we by ourselves don't know the answers. We need your guidance. So we walk humbly with you, seeking your justice and loving the mercy that you have for all people. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We've been going through... uh, the Gospel of Luke, and talking about the stories that Jesus told, the parables. And this morning, we're talking about the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And so in this story that Jesus tells to a group of people called the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day, he explains that there's a rich man who's very wealthy, very well off. He has very fancy clothes, and he has a huge house. He has all he could ever want, and he's eating huge amounts of very expensive food every day, feasting every day like it's a party. And he then explains, Jesus then explains that there's a poor man named Lazarus. And he sits at the rich man's gate, longing to have some of the food that the rich man has. 
Lazarus is very, very poor, and he's covered in sores, and he's sick, and he's starving. And all he can do is sit and watch the rich man feasting and feasting and feasting. Jesus explains that both, both of these men die. Oh, my mic fell. Both of these men die, and the tables have turned that it is now Lazarus who is welcomed into heaven and the rich man is not. But what Jesus isn't saying in this parable, in this story, is that it's bad to have things. He's not saying that it's bad to be rich. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that it's what the rich man did. He didn't help Lazarus. He didn't show care and compassion for Lazarus. He didn't love Lazarus. And God calls us to love one another, doesn't he? He calls us to love each other because loving each other shows that we love God. And so this story is less about the fact that the man is rich and more about the fact that He didn't use his riches to love other people. He didn't use what God had given him. And while we might not be all rich or have a lot of things or be able to feast every day on expensive foods, we all have ways that we can love other people. There's people in our lives that we can show love to. And so I just want us to think about that as we, yeah, as we continue with our worship service this morning. So let me just pray, and then we'll continue on. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for worship, and that we can be together. Whether we're here in person or whether we're at home online, we ask that you would be here with us, and that you would help us to remember that we are called to love one another. Help us to be people who love you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare to hear the word of God this morning, uh, let's come before God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the Bible. We know it to be true and infallible. Uh, However, we get preoccupied with our worldly concerns and sometimes miss the truth therein. We would ask that you would open our hearts and minds this morning that we could hear the truth in this scripture today. We ask this in Jesus' name, your Son and our Savior. Amen. I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And this is the New Revised Standard Version. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames." But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and remember, and Lazarus in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed 
so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send them, him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, again. Um, thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's great to be with you guys. Um, I just want to extend a thank you out to all of the church family who has been praying for me and, um, yeah, has been really supportive and, and welcoming over my uh, first few months here at St. Andrews. It's, um, it's been a really great introduction, and I look forward to, uh, yeah, many months to come. In Mumbai, India, there's a large mansion called Antilia. It is one of the largest homes in the world at just over, four, just over 400,000 square feet. It's 27 stories high and has a staff of just about 600 people. It contains a movie theater, a swimming pool, a private temple, 170 car garage, and a snow room, interestingly enough. Uh, there are gardens, health centers, and spas. All of these things are accessible via 11 high-speed elevators. It looms over the city, a monument to a shrewd entrepreneurial spirit where more than 4 million people live below the poverty line. The cost of this house was more than $1, uh, $1 billion to build. And when it was built, the owner faced backlash from critics who said it was an ostentatious and extravagant show of wealth in the face of extreme poverty. And experts estimate that by building just 17 stories high instead of the full 27, the owner could have saved nearly $500 million. And if that had been given to the poor and the marginalized in the city, the owner could have doubled the annual income of over 700,000 people just in his city alone. This story that Jesus tells about, rich man and the, about the rich man and Lazarus falls near the end of his teachings on money in the Gospel of Luke. And it comes in the journey towards Jerusalem, towards his, the final culmination of his earthly ministry and the fulfillment of God's plan for salvation. Some of the aspects of this story take on a deeper meaning when we view them in that, with that picture in mind. And it follows the text that Peter preached last Sunday on the shrewd business manager. But there's an important shift to take note of here. Because last week, the text that Peter preached on was addressed to the disciples. And in between that story and this story, there's a chunk of text in Luke where the audience switches. After, he teaches, after Jesus teaches his disciples in the story of the shrewd business manager... He hears scoffing from the Pharisees. And Luke records this as saying, the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this and they ridiculed him. So he turns to them and he begins to teach about the kingdom of God and what it really looks like to follow him. Jesus introduces an idea that's prevalent throughout scripture and that will help us see this story better. That idea is that God looks at the heart. And it's from our hearts that our lives take shape. Now just imagine with me being there in the crowd when Jesus turns to the Pharisees. I have a feeling that they knew already before he began this story 
how intelligent he was. And I think deep down in their hearts, they knew that he was right. The Pharisees were people, as Luke mentions, who loved money. They were well off, they were well educated, they were religious leaders, and they had authority. But they were living in an invasive Roman culture that praised the wealthy and condemned the poor. It was seen as a good thing to flaunt your wealth and hold it over people, to reject caring for the poor because it would inconvenience you. But this is a stark contrast to what God had called his people to do. Because Jewish society at that time was meant to care for the poor. The commands given to the Jewish people by God regarding financial debts and providing for the poor, the way they harvest their fields was meant to eliminate poverty. So the very fact that there was such an impoverished man as Lazarus pointed out to the Pharisees that they had failed. Even though they claimed to follow God's law, they had neglected to care for the poor. And so Jesus continues on with his story. He paints two portraits for his audience. The first person he he describes is dressed in purple robes and fine linens. He's feasting sumptuously every single day. The second is a beggar lying at the rich man's gate, covered in sores and starving. And there's a few things that I think we might miss as modern Western readers here. Because the color of the rich man's robes is important. I mean, to us, you know, it doesn't really matter what color your clothes are as long as they're clothes. But in Jesus' day, the color purple was a royal color. It represented status, wealth, authority. It was an important color. And if you look in our uh, sanctuary, we have a stained glass window of Jesus. Um, And in the parable, even though Jesus isn't represented as a king, The artist's rendition of him wearing a purple robe shows that even in Jesus' ministry, he was a king. Purple was also very, very expensive. And so there's no way this man could have afforded these robes without a significant amount of disposable income. And that income certainly didn't come from his manual labor because his fine linens were too good for that. The way he was dressed showed that he was a man of great wealth, But he didn't really have to work for it. He had other people to do that for him. He had the best of the best, and he had plenty of it. Meanwhile, we have Lazarus, the poor man. And instead of being covered by fine linens and purple robes, he's covered with sores. Sores that dogs come and lick. And while he sits there in agony, too weak from starvation to even ward off the dogs, He watches the rich man feast and feast and feast every single day, wishing that he could have the portions of food that fall from his table and go to waste. Jesus paints a picture of a great separation here, a great disparity between the haves and the have-nots. And it's clear to us, of course, which one is which. But something we might find interesting is that Lazarus is the only man in Jesus' parables to receive the dignity of having a name. Though he was poor and destitute, he had nothing to give anyone, but he did have a name. The name Lazarus means God has helped. So Lazarus has nothing but God's help. And after giving, giving his audience an intense picture of both sides of the spectrum, Jesus' story continues with that one inevitable truth we all face, which is death. Neither the rich man in all his riches nor Lazarus in all his poverty can avoid it. However, it is after death that we see the tables have turned, and the true reality of life in God's kingdom comes to the surface. The description of each of their deaths is also something that we should take note of. Lazarus dies and is carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. Meanwhile, the rich man has a, has a burial, a custom that was quite expensive and extravagant. So we see even here Jesus making the point of contrasting their two situations. 
Lazarus had absolutely nothing, not even enough to have a burial ceremony. But he was carried away to Abraham's side. The father of the Jewish people and their founder, he was a symbol of the family of God. And being welcomed to his side was a symbol of feasting with the family of God in paradise. It was a picture of being welcomed into the kingdom. And while the rich man, even in death, is trying to, to squeeze every last ounce of extravagance he can out of life, he's not welcomed in. And here is where the true reality of God's kingdom comes to the surface. Could it be that through death, true life actually comes? Because Lazarus here has nothing to offer. He has nothing but God's help. And God looks at his heart and welcomes him in. We have these two men, one who was rich in life and lived to show it, and one who lived in complete poverty. In death, both men enter into eternity, and Jesus' story has the roles reversed. Abraham, or Lazarus, 
is reclining at Abraham's side in paradise. And the rich man is in Hades in agony. The irony is not lost on Jesus' audience here, but just to bring the point home, he has Abraham remind him, the rich man, that is, that in life he had all he needed. He had all the comfort he could ever want and more. He had everything. But now, in this life, in the true life, Lazarus is comforted. And in a moment that shows he just doesn't quite get it, the rich man asked for Lazarus to come down and give him some water. And in reply, Abraham tells him that there is a great chasm, a separation that is fixed between them. And the reality of the situation begins to sit begins to set in. We can almost imagine the thoughts going through the through the mind of the rich man. Maybe he is angry that the situation hasn't turned out quite the way he had hoped. He had gotten everything he wanted up until this point. Then perhaps regret. Regret that he had made some poor choices, obviously. Perhaps regret that his willful separation of Lazarus from him in life, had had consequences that impacted him on a far deeper level. Then fear, fear for his family that's still alive and presumably heading for the same outcome. In a last act of desperation, he asks for Lazarus to be sent back so that they can turn from their ways. But Jesus ends his story here with a searing comment about the stubbornness of the rich man's family. If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets who they have, they won't listen to someone who is raised from the dead. And of course, Jesus is the master storyteller. And he found a way to weave in his own story of his death and resurrection. It's important to remember how well-read Jesus' audience is here. They were meticulous in their adherence to the Jewish scriptures, or at least they thought they were when it was convenient to them. So Jesus' phrase, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, which is a shorthand for the Jewish scriptures, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead, is quite shocking. The foreshadowing here is important. His own death and resurrection won't even help them see the error of their ways. For the Pharisees, their love of money, their strict rule-following and self-righteousness has made them forget about what it actually means to follow God. And I think that it's easy for us, at least it is for me, to reduce this story to a quick moral reminder or ethical phrase. It's easier for me to condemn the fact that he was rich as the reason that he didn't go to heaven and to see being rich as an inherently evil position to be in. It's easy for me to elevate being poor as the moral high ground. But I think that might be too narrow of of a view. I think what Jesus is trying to communicate here in this story is that it's primarily about love. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus mentions that the two greatest commandments, the ones that all of the law and the prophets, all of the Jewish scriptures hang on, are these. To love the Lord your God with all your mind, your soul, and your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And through this poignant story, Jesus points out that the rich man who represents the Pharisees had no room in his heart for loving God and for loving others because he had loved money so deeply. Even though the Pharisees were religious and strict about following the law, they had no love for God. They had no love for their neighbor, Lazarus. And we are not talking necessarily here about romantic attraction kind of love but rather love as that thing which drives our lives, 
which causes us to make certain choices, to see the world in a certain way. We're talking about love as the center point from which all of our lives take shape. Philosopher and cultural critic James K.A. Smith says that human beings are not primarily thinking beings, but loving beings. To say it another way, we don't think our way through life, we love our way through it. Our love shapes our lives. And intuitively, I think we know this is true. It isn't necessarily the things like, I love pizza, or I have a deep appreciation for a certain hobby or a musician or something like that. And maybe the idea of love is kind of confusing to some people. I know it is for me. And I think a more approachable idea for us might be the concept of desire. That thing that's inside of us that dictates how we see the world, how we function in it, how we see ourselves in it, and how we navigate it. The thing we all strive for, that point from which we all begin to build out our lives. For the Pharisees, this deepest desire, this deepest love was money. The leaders of of the Jewish faith had let money supplant God in their hearts. They had let the love of money invade their hearts so deeply that they had no room for God and subsequently no room for people like Lazarus. This story is not about the sums of money. It's not about the fact that they had lots of money or had power or had education. It's not a a declaration that being wealthy is inherently evil. For Jesus, the fault was not with any of these things, but rather the fault of the Pharisees and of the rich man was that their hearts belonged to money and not to God. They had become so concerned about themselves that they neglected to care for the poor. A theme that's all over the Jewish scriptures. Their lives were self-indulgent, arrogant, and self-centered instead of generous, humble, and self-giving. Because our love defines who we are. There are various places in the New Testament that talk about this. This idea that our love, we will be known by our love. The rich man and the Pharisees missed that. They didn't see that most basic truth of the, God, of the kingdom of God, that God looks at what is in our heart. God looks at what we love, and our lives are shaped by it. When the kingdom of God has taken root in our hearts, our lives begin to reflect it through a love of our neighbor, through care and compassion, through justice, mercy, and humility, through self-giving love for people, even people we disagree with, even people who who are our enemies. And it's this love, love for God, properly placed, that leads to eternal life. So the real tragedy of this story is that because he and his family had lack or had loved money so completely, they were unable to recognize that they lacked the love for God. And not even somebody coming back from the dead could change that. Unfortunately, this becomes not just a story for the Pharisees, who even after the death and resurrection of Jesus himself continue on the path of self-indulgence. They had missed the point so deeply, the point that their entire scripture pointed to, the savior of the world. They missed it so deeply because they had loved money so completely. I told the story at the beginning not to condemn or praise anyone, but simply to help us see This is a glaringly obvious example of love of money, for sure. And we can see that pretty clearly. And I think our hearts are rightly upset or concerned by it. But I don't, I don't want to act as though I'm more righteous than the guy who built that house. Because, I mean, if we follow the pattern of the world, what else are we supposed to do with wealth? 
Why on earth would someone sacrifice something for someone else when our number one message is to look out for yourself? Can we really blame anyone for that? It's not like this is just an over there or outside of the church issue. For me, my life is full, full of examples of this. Consistently choosing to love things other than God. To love things more than I love my neighbor. Perhaps this story Jesus told can help us to see that we, don't re- that we often don't realize how blind we can be to our misplaced love. Because it doesn't have to be something like money. There are many things in our, life that dem- in our lives that demand attention that have the power to influence our choices. Perhaps it is the love of money, perhaps the love of fame, power, influence, attention, maybe the love of safety or comfort, a misplaced love of people where we seek to get whatever we can from them and give nothing back. Whatever it is, it can quickly steer us towards ourselves and towards this world's reality rather than pointing us towards God and pointing us towards others and steering us into the reality of the true, the true reality of God's kingdom. It's on this journey towards God's kingdom that we continue to grow and we continue to love, to learn to love God and to love our neighbor. And this is a hard journey for sure. It's not just a set it and forget it kind of thing. We will continue to fail. We'll continue to love those things that don't deserve it. And we'll continue to not love our neighbor as we should. And yet, we are invited as Lazarus to come to God and receive his help. We are invited to give God our hearts, to have him look at them, and to help us love him more. To end off, I would like to read a brief excerpt from the poem In the Bleak Midwinter by Christina Rossetti. Uh, Most of us know this more as a Christmas carol, but um, yeah, it was written as a poem first, and I, uh, I really love the last verse here. What can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would give a lamb If I were a wise man, I would do my part. But what can I give him? Give him my heart. Give him my heart. Amen. Let's pray. God of grace, we do want to give you our hearts to make you the number one desire in our lives. There are so many things that compete, that draw our distracted attention, that say that they matter more. Help us to make you and your kingdom the number one priority in our lives, the thing we desire above all else. We thank you that you will do that in us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We confess that we do not always see the needs of those around us. At times we assume that the needs that they have are due to their own fault, and so we blame. We are not people who show mercy. Teach us to be people who love to show mercy. We come praying for our neighbors, people we live beside in our communities, that we would be able to see needs and share your good news, your love, your care. We pray for our nation, for our world for places where mercy and humility are needed. Between the Ukraine and Russia, 
China and Taiwan, Myanmar, Rwanda, Burundi, the Congo. The list goes on, Lord. We pray that your mercy and grace be poured into our world. We remember those who are sick. We pray for those who grieve. We come ourselves as people who are overwhelmed by all that is happening around us. Let us know that our help rests in you alone, that you are our help. In this silence, we bring to you our thanksgivings and our requests, knowing that you hear us. We pray all of these things in the strong name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We extend a warm welcome to all who worship with us. It's good to get together to celebrate God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You'll find announcements in the inserts in your bulletin, and I want to highlight a number of them. The first I want to note is that we are in this transition period as a province as we move from complete closures to becoming much more open um, and return to that. And so next Sunday here in the sanctuary, what you see with the ropes and tape will continue on the 27th of February, but on March the 6th, the ropes and the tape will be gone because there are no restrictions and no limits at that point. However, we invite everyone who is in worship to be gracious and generous. Because what I mean by that is this is a nervous time. People are not quite sure how this will all work. And so please, if someone's in your spot, give them some space. They might need just some space. So ask before you sit right beside them. Ask if they want you that quite that close. I know we all like each other, but just be gracious in giving people space as we navigate this new time. Um, so just, it'll take some negotiating, but we'll work it out just fine. While we're talking about that, Lent is coming, which means that on March the 1st, which is the day we reopen as a province, is Shrove Tuesday, and there will be a pancake supper here at the church. Two sittings at five and at six, 60 people each. And again, although it's not required by law for us to do this, we're just being safe and comforting to people, and we will be asking for vaccine pass vaccination passports to be shown to come to that pancake supper. Down the road, probably not, but this one we just are... We're just being gracious, okay? So just give us all space as we navigate this. So two sittings, five and six, 60 people at each. Um, please call ahead to book your spot. The funds raised will go to Abbotsford Flood Relief um, through the Midnight Central Committee. As things reopen, there'll be Bible studies reopening, etc., cetera, in the, in, the, in the church. And so keep track of those things as well. We'll continue to send out emails to people one thing you could really help us with, if you know of people who do not have email access, please pass their name on to Liz in the church office as we try to find ways to continue to keep people updated. And we recognize that email doesn't work for all. So if you know people for whom it's not working, email doesn't work, please let us know and we'll find other ways to contact them and keep them up to speed with what's happening. Let's pray for the offering. God of grace, take these gifts that we return to you. Use them for your honor and for your glory, that all the world might know your love and grace made known to us in Jesus Christ, 
in whose name we pray. Amen. And let's join together in singing God of grace and God of glory. now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, because now and forevermore. Amen.